Uh, okay, so uh, welcome everybody. First, uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming in. I'm really happy to see all of you here. Uh, I hope that I will kind of fulfill your expectations, or actually, I need to give you some kind of disappointment already, uh, which is that in this presentation, you won't see a single line of code. And to be honest, this is, this is essentially done on purpose, because people write too much code, contrary to what is actually needed. So <coughs> within this presentation, we are going to focus on a little bit different context. So not only on the code itself, but all the things that are going to be around the code, right? So your env the environment, the practices, etc., cetera, et cetera, uh, related to software development or uh, product development, uh, because I think, and that's my point that I'm trying to make, is that the understanding of the actual environment you're in may help you out uh, with the software itself. So as you can see, the uh, title for the presentation is PHP Development for Large Agile Projects, Overview and Hints for Developers. So uh, an input for this is actually my own experience. So I'm going actually to refer to some like real life cases that I had uh, in my life. Essentially, myself, I'm a passionate programmer, uh, like for many, many years, starting from a kid. Um, in the so-called meantime, I was also involved in you know things like analysis, business analysis, or architecture, or uh, scrum mastery, or for example, being the product owner, proxy product owner, all that kind of stuff. And what it actually gave me is a little bit insight from different sides on the same problem, which is like software development, right? So uh, what I'm trying to do here is actually to share those insights with you, to show the bigger picture, how it's looking, at least from my perspective. Uh, and yeah, and finally discuss it at the end. Um, so let's start. First of all, I would like to point out how the agenda is going to lay out, so a proper like introduction to the problem uh, or on based concepts. Then we are going to define a, a particular problem that, that we are going to have. Just review the possible solutions for that and then there is going to be a small summary. Okay, so we have that buzzword agile, right? It's, uh, today you hear that really, really a lot. But let's try to dig into like the Cambridge Dictionary uh, definitions for the word. So physically, it means that you should be able to move your body quickly and easily, which means you know like quick shifts of directions and uh, simply be able to keep up with 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 the pace. So you you're simply turning around, switching uh, directions, but you do not lose your speed, your velocity, this kind of stuff. Second, mentally is to uh, be able to think quickly and clearly, right? So it's not a fixed mindset. It's about being kind of dynamic when it comes to, to the problems. And finally, the management part, uh, which is used for describing ways of planning and doing work in which it is understood that making changes as they are needed is an important part of the job. So that's the point where developers and programmers actually have the biggest problem so <laughs> the second word that's in the title is large project. So we could actually ask ourselves, and I got that question, what's actually a large project, right? And uh, the consultant answer would be, it depends, right? So um, you can think about large projects in terms of you know, like big code base, or a lot of services to maintain, or a lot of users, a lot of data or a lot of teams on the project actually, right? So there are many, many factors that could uh, set a project and make it to be said that it's large, right? So the second question could be uh, possibly that, can something that's large be agile at all? If you have a like, big object, its ability to be agile in terms of shifting directions and adapting to certain stuff, uh, is quite reduced, right? So actually, nature found uh, the answer for that. This is a flock for, of birds. As you know, this kind of loosely coupled structures, you know, you know the key, key point, loosely coupled, 
uh, they are able to move in a different directions. Why? Because all of them are connected only on a you know, like conceptual level. They're connected by the idea of moving in a certain direction, but they're not physically connected. Now, this is a thing that <coughs> we also use, uh, should do, do kind of, you know, like instinctly. Uh, we like to divide and we should divide bigger problems to smaller ones. So uh, let's look at a typical, let's call it project, but I intentionally, I actually crossed the project part out uh, because the first way about thinking about your software or uh, the thing that you do is actually making kind of a product, right? So right now, if you look on, uh, on this, you can imagine that this whole box is your uh, product that you're developing. Now, inside, in fact, there are always some natural uh, lines that can allow you to break the problem more and more down. So these may be like bundles if you have like a symphony project which is a, I don't know a, a monolith or, or something like that this could be particular services in SOA architecture these could be microservices etc etc right so uh, the th way I really like uh, to think about this kind of stuff in terms of uh, programming is um, is the way that Visual Studio and uh, Microsoft did it uh, in their IDE, which is calling the thing on, on the left a complete solution, and these elements here, different projects. Uh, so if you're breaking out your pro product actually to parts, it's, it's finally forming a kind of a solution, and each part of it is a different project. Now, the thing is that you really need to think about your product as a solution for some particular problem, which may consist of small atomic elements, like a service in this kind, like a bundle, like a, I don't know, module. And what's really important, uh, each one of those blocks deserves the same amount of quality. The, it, it's kind of, uh, each one of those blocks deserves the same amount of care. Now, back again, we have a uh, known integration process, right? You take the bits, you take the services, you do some uh, integration testing, you finally integrate it whole and, uh, entirely to uh, a whole solution and deploy it back as a full solution. So uh, a different uh, thing uh, around here is uh, the talk about the fundamental problem that we are going to solve. So. There's the one thing that's sure about software development, like in general, there always will be a change. Now, the change may come in a different form. It may change, uh, it may be a change related to scope. It may be a change related to the team. So if you're losing like half of the people on the team, you still have to adapt to it. So you probably will have to change the way you work in order to deliver stuff on time with the right quality and this kind of stuff. Now. I think it's very important for everybody to remember that because the sooner we accept the fact that our work could be at any given moment modified by a change of a different sort and being like mindset ready to embrace the change actually makes you uh, feel like better and gives you some relief. I want to make a small <laughs> experiment with you guys. So, uh, that are the best requirements that you could possibly get for a product. So a small to-do list. Uh, let's call it, uh, for now, our little backlog, which consists like of four items that should have been uh, developed within the product. So you should be able to display a product. You should be able to put a product in the cart. You should be able to place an order. And eventually, uh, there are going to be some vouchers uh, that will give discounts to people, right? So the experiment is, these are like four thingies that you have to kind of implement. So I'm giving you guys like one minute to think about an architecture for this, uh, like an initial one, an initial proposal. How would you model that problem yourselves 
if you had, you know, like uh, a chance to implement this kind of stuff, okay? So, a minute to figure out your best architecture that you possibly could do for this. Uh, I'll play a management person, half time left. <coughs> what it's going to be done? <laughs> ETA, this kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so we run out for the minute, so <coughs> I think everybody has like a grasp of how they want to approach it. Now, <coughs> let's say you've started the work, two weeks passed. So you're able to actually display the product, congratulations, it's really, really awesome. Second thing, you even are able to put the products in the cart, so that's really cool. Actually, you started the order placement, but uh, didn't finish it at the time. So actually, you didn't even touch the vouchers at the point, right? But since two weeks passed, when it comes to agile environments or actual market, uh, because you know that's e-commerce, right? This, this is a typ typical e-commerce problem for a store. So for some reason, I don't know, the business comes in and tells you, well. We need product comparison first. Before we finish the rest of that, we need product comparison. Actually, besides that, we need like product sets. And these product sets should be functional because I should be able to put a whole product set into the cart. And I need a others boss also functionality on, on the uh, product view. Also, before we go with vouchers, I actually want a discount code and then some kind of invoicing perhaps, and you know, this kind of stuff. So please tell me if it's that how you feel. This is, this is happening to really a lot of people because initially when you are trying to figure out, you know, like kind of an architecture for your solution, you're not having the broader context, and the more uh, dynamic the problem is, the more uh, things that you do not control are going to come in. So for example, if you're working in like e-commerce sites, uh, next to Christmas, things really get crazy, because all of, a lot of people are buying stuff for Christmas using websites these days, right? So business always can come in with a, a new idea. So eventually, you know, it's really easy in this kind of situations to end up like with this feeling and with this kind of product. That's actually a really uh, old image. So how Apple does it, how Google does it, and actually how will you do it, kind of. Everybody saw that, right? And th that's not even PHP my admin. It's like a user story, user story, user story. So how do you possibly can that? <laughs> actually, I, I think uh, to be fair, PHP my admin is a really cool software uh, because I I'm personally in the opinion that uh, since you can train people to use that in your product, you can train them to use PHP my admin and operate on tables and they will probably do the same amount of work with the same amount of time. So if that's the case, you're doing it wrong, right? It's like bad by design, kind of. So um, as you see, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty intense process. You can end up with like really awkward results. So how we can manage it? We actually need some kind of way 
to deal with these kind of changes, right? To avoid these kind of situations, because that's you know building up technical depth, building up like functional depth or this kind of stuff. We don't want to do that. So <coughs> the thing is that going back a little bit to the beginning of the presentation, we need to kind of stay agile about things. So in order to you know like be able to shift in those when when new obstacles uh, pop out in in front of you, but there are, I think, limitless w things that limit your able to ability to be agile. And for example, it may be the programming language itself. PHP, in, in that regard, is quite open. You can do a lot of things in, in different ways, but it actually makes a problem itself because, because of that. Uh, the second thing is like the organizational uh, culture. Mm, so depending on on the place that you're like working or on the client for for your working, uh, it may totally influence you in terms of what kind of decision you can make, what's going to happen right now, and and this kind of stuff. The business model that's very that's very important. When it today agile is essentially kind of sold all the time. So you can have like two types of company. You can have a product company, which, which is using Agile. And in this case, people mostly are quite committed to the product, right? A lot of you guys are working on, in a single product and it's your day-to-day -day work and you want to get that software to be really good and uh, benefit users, right? But things are con quite different when you're working for a service providing a company. So for example, essentially developers are rented and these kind of developers actually go into the product, they build the product, but in the back of their heads they know that if this, this isn't going to be that product and this project, I'm going to work for a different client without changing my employer, for example, right? So um, if you have people like that, you may then end up with, with, with diff different, totally different results. Uh, things further, processes, methodologies, and workflows. Well, Jira, you probably saw the most basic uh, workflow on Jira. It's like to do uh, in progress a couple of closed status reopened. It's really sad if you need to spend like two hours clearing out your workflow in Jira because it's that complicated. I actually had this case. Uh, we were working on uh, we were working on a project that had really, really, really complex workflow in Jira. I had to spend like two hours to move things around because we had to get acceptance for like everybody on the project, regardless of who who it was. I would even say nearly a janitor. So. Uh, this kind of complex workflows actually also impede your ability to like, I don't know, deliver or get the proper feedback fast. Requirements for the product. Uh, these are, the, the, the things that you saw are, uh, I mean, uh, in the to-do list, in the example, these are actually functional requirements. But today, uh, the important requirements are also the non-functional requirements. So for example, responsive. So support for mobile, things like security, so things like performance, things like scalability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With each uh, new non-functional requirement, you add another complexity level to the product. So imagine that your uh, architecture or your solution that you figured out a couple of minutes ago would have to be now like extremely secured. So all of the data uh, related to the clients should have been encrypted probably move to a different storage because of that and and this kind of stuff is your architecture going to be able to adapt to this kind of uh, change easily without so you know like uh, building up a really really big cost there's a whole if you look uh, you know, on wikipedia for a list of non functional requirements that are like industry standard right now that's a really really long list and if you have uh, so complex uh, requirements in terms of non-functional, non uh, which actually are being carried out from feature to feature to feature to feature, 
You may add function, the functional requirements, but they will still have to slice through all that non-functional stuff uh, on, the, on, on the way. Implemented solutions. So you've picked a bad framework. You've hacked a couple of things. So now if you're going to add new functionality, you will need to hack a hack and then hack it again. And it's like endless inception, right? Because if your implementation is, sorry to say, crappy, uh, actually, uh, you're going to pay for that. So th here kicks the term technical debt, right? So uh, about technical debt, it's going to be there always. <laughs> you're not going to be ever, ever, ever uh, able to pay it off like completely. It's going to be always. So if you cannot like remove it completely, you only can manage it. So do your best to uh, avoid technical debt because it's going to kick back uh, and fight when you're going to add new functionality. Uh, of course, the teams themselves. So imagine you have a project when you have, I don't know, like four or five teams of different people in different locations, different time zones, different cultures, this kind of stuff. People that do not know each other, but still they meet on the single code base. So fights happen. Uh, misunderstandings happen, some painful code reviews happen, especially those, uh, because <laughs> people actually, when it comes to code reviews, it's a funny thing, people feel quite really protected when it comes uh, to uh, commenting somebody, other, uh, somebody else's code, because if I were talking to you directly, we probably would put up a fight, right? But uh, in, terms, in terms of um, uh, comments, it's safe to post any kind of insult inside that comment box, right? He ain't going to hit me back. So uh, this, this kind of things actually give you the permission to, to fight a little bit, and this actually makes the whole project pay, right? Because your code is not integrated with everybody else, story is delayed, and you know, what are the repercussions? And this uh, finally touches people. Actually, uh, Ken Beck, uh, in his book about extreme programming, uh, wrote about a funny technique of five whys. So if, if you have a problem, you actually should ask why for five times, and you always find that this is a people problem. So for example, uh, our builds are constantly failing. Why they are failing? Uh, because uh, somebody is doing something, okay, why he's doing it, right? So you, within five steps, you are actually able to find out what's, what's going to happen. And this is a practice from extreme programming called root cause analysis, right? So if things are really bad, uh, you need to know why. So as, as the technique of five whys actually is really good for that. So as you can see, the problem is really, really uh, complicated. So I decided to uh, break it down to uh, separate parts uh, and define the dimensions for the solution. So the dimensions that I would uh, like to uh, define are on the product level. So I'd say I want to build the right product. So meeting the requirements for the users and uh, f essentially being applicable for business, right? The second thing is about the teams. So when, it, when I'm part of the team, I want to build, uh, mm, oh, it's a typo there, but I want to build the product in the right way. So it's a build the right product contrary to build the product right. So uh, the last part is the individual. So I want to do a great job in a great environment. So in order to address these three levels, we are going to talk uh, about uh, each one of them separately, and uh, you won't be actually, you know, like surprised that, in terms of product, we are going to use Scrum. Actually, I, I heard there's a statistic that, like, 66% of uh, agile uh, projects are being done using Scrum. How many of you was uh, working with Scrum? Okay, quite a lot, and. Uh, the rest didn't work with Scrum or worked with the, the other stuff, like Kanban? Okay, who's working 100% hardcore waterfall? With micromanagement? Oh, okay. We need to save that guy, actually. 
Okay, so just to rephrase, I, I really want to quickly go through that. You know the story, product backlog, so functional requirements, uh, the thing that's really important about this image is this, that at the top of the backlog you have really small stories in terms of estimation, complexity, effort required, and this kind of stuff, right? So who's responsible for playing with the product backlog? Is the product owner. And the role of the product owner is put the most important stuff at the very top so it contains the most valuable things to do, right? There's a thing called uh, ongoing refinement process. We have the sprint team, which based on the sprint planning, for example, which two weeks, builds up the sprint backlog, so they pull in the most important things. That's actually quite legitimately shown that this bit put over here, right, mm, into the sprint. Then they go with the daily scrums and all that meetings that the management hates. Eventually, uh, they show something on the sprint review. Also, make a retrospective. Everything has a feedback loop. So, new requirements, as you can see, from each sprint review, new things can kick in like two weeks. And, it's, it, and it should happen. If it's not happening on sprint reviews, it's, it's really bad, right? But also some ideas about how you are working are going in here. There's a different thing. Anybody heard about that? Very good. Somebody sees a StarCraft reference or not? Okay, we require more minerals, so it's th this kind of uh, thingy. Okay, for those who do not know, uh, you know, essentially a scrum team consists from like five to nine people, uh, so it's a quite limited amount of uh, people on the project, right? But today things have to scale, so Nexus framework is prepared for scaling uh, scrum, uh, which essentially means that now you do not have like single team, but up to nine teams, fully functional nine scrum teams. Each of those uh, teams have one, let's call it an expert or a delegate or representative, as it's uh, said in uh, the um, Nexus framework document. And these guys, those guys so from those teams form the so-called Nexus team. And these people are responsible for picking up the stories for the teams, managing dependencies so that different teams do not get in the way of one another, just to, you know, like, still be able to integrate stuff. Now, what I, why I'm putting this over here? Because in a big project, you might have, like, a multiple of teams, right? So if you're not coordinating this and things uh, go wild, this is, this is going to kick you at some point. So that's why I'm po pointing this as a solution for, for the product level, right? So if you want to organize things, uh, you should possibly do that. Now, the thing that people frequently misinterpret, do not understand about Scrum, is not doing the product level by level by level by level. So that's what the top picture depicts. Right? So you're not making the wheels, you're not making the, uh, I don't know, uh, the body of the car or different parts, then integrate it and you get the happy client at the very end. It's rather gradually improving the design in order to uh, get to the place where your client can uh, be. As you can see, the architecture changes. You don't start with actually the, the whole car as a concept already, you build it up gradually. And the funny part about this image, the outcome is different. Because during the time, we've actually discovered that the guy doesn't want to have the roof in the car, right? So he wanted a cabrio instead of a roofed one. So if you're thinking about Scrum and being, you know, like agile and how to build a product. That's, that's kind of a mindset that I think everybody should have in terms of understanding, like, keep it simple, stupid, right? Let's, let's build the minimal and functional thing that we need and just move forward, move forward. So the last thing that I want to put in terms of agile itself, there was a 
clarification made recently, this year, by uh, the guys who invented Scrum, and they d decided to put explicitly uh, the Scrum values, and I think it's really important to everybody uh, to understand what are the values and what they mean. So it's like courage, focus, commitment, respect, and, and openness. And I'm not going to read it all, all. you can read it all yourselves, uh, but these values are really, really important if you're working on an Agile project with people from different locations, different teams, different cultures, et cetera, et cetera. Each one of this is, is, is equally important. A funny part about commitment. In the first uh, the versions of Scrum, uh, the word commitment was used to describe what the people are actually going to take in the sprint and, and people were, you know, like brought to uh, account um, based on their so-called commitments. Now, the guys already saw that this is getting, you know, like uh, misused by, especially by microcontrolling management people. So they changed the name to forecast. So the teams aren't making commitments at the beginning of the sprint. They make a forecast how they can po how much they can possibly deliver, and now they decided to bring back uh, the word commitment, but with explicit clarification that this is not about making a promise or anything like that because we do not know what's going to change in the meantime, right? It's that people personally commit to achieving the goals of the Scrum team. So it's like not committing that you will like deliver it in 100%. It's that, that you are going to do your very best to do it. And it's, it's only about mindset. It's not about, uh, I don't know, like particular stories or this kind of stuff. Okay, so there are some problems with Scrum uh, that you need to be aware about. Uh, one of those is like using it like a weapon. Uh, so we call it a weapon shield. Uh, what's that? It's for example, if I'm going to use it as a shield, no, you cannot approach the team. We're agile. You cannot modify it because we have a sprint, so you need to wait for a sprint. And, and this is like using, uh, using Agile to justify things that you don't want to do. So you're using it like a sh shield. And uh, contrary, um, the whip part, actually related to the dark scrum by uh, Ron Jeffers, um, is the place when the management kicks in and they want to be on your retrospective and they want to lay all the tons of hate that they have because of the last sprint on you during that retrospective, for example, right? So using Scrum as a pressure tool instead of a thing that will help you out to develop things. Uh, another, uh, problem, uh, another set of problems that I personally see uh, is that you feel like you have like constant deadlines, so each sprint is a deadline, 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 deadline. So if these are being considered as deadlines, what happens? If you're close to a deadline, you're making mistakes. You're making trade-offs, you will sacrifice tests, you will sacrifice quality this way just in order to deliver. So uh, this, this, is, this is actually wrong. And another thing, narrowed perspective. So within a sprint you need to work on a certain set of functionality, but still, you need to have like a broader context, what may possibly happen in a second, right? So if you have the narrowed perspective, uh, narrowed only to the scope of the sprint itself, uh, you're probably going to have architectural problems as well in the future. And I'm putting numbers because I have references uh, at the end uh, of, uh, of the presentation. And this is an um, article about 24 uh, Scrum pitfalls summarized. And it's really worth <coughs> reading. So the biggest problem and, and what's, what's really painful for, for Scrum and for teams is that when you have actually waterfall people trying to do waterfall using Scrum and nothing changes except that you have like deliver everything two weeks uh, with perfect quality and this kind of stuff uh, and you're getting kicked for uh, any kind of, I don't know, delays or something like that. Okay, so within the team levels, as you can see, uh, Scrum on its own leaves the imp implementation details to the teams, to the developers. Scrum never said that you should use a certain technology or uh, design code, uh, this kind of stuff, only by yourself. So, uh, sorry, uh, in any, by any means of, of, of Scrum ways, right? There's nothing in there. It's like that Scrum is really good for the product level, but when things go to the sprint teams, 
a different uh, stuff is actually required to uh, go uh, with this. And this is the place uh, where I think that extreme programming practices kick in. So <coughs> a brief uh, introduction to uh, the uh, extreme programming. So uh, inventor, Ken the Beck, possibly. Uh, who knows Ken the Beck, by the way? OK. Ken Beck, also the inventor of test-driven development. Uh, author of JUnit, uh, the first uh, unit testing framework created for Java. He splits uh, the extreme programming practices uh, to two different uh, categories. These are primarily, and so that's a really hard word. It's like corollary or something like that. Um, the thing is that the division has been made um, in order to separate those things which with, uh, with which you can start from the things that would be really hard to start at the beginning. So for example, uh, in terms of primary, you have things like energized work, per programming, and 10 minute build. Uh, or uh, on the second category, you have things like customer involvement, uh, incremental deployment, or shrinking teams. The thing is that the second set of practices actually um, has a, a lot of requirements in order to be implemented uh, correctly. So they, he had Mm, so sort of advises to go with the primary first, but I don't like that division, to be honest. Uh, I think there's a, a better thing to do, better way to do that. But in a second, as you can see, uh, XP so extreme programming also has values: communication, feedback, simplicity, courage, respect. Pretty close to uh, Scrum itself. Looking back on on the previous slide. So <coughs> these do things actually when it comes to like the basis, so the values that they want to address um, are uh, quite the same, especially that actually both guys from Scrum and Ken Beck and um, also Uncle Bob and these kind of people, they all signed the Agile Manifesto, right? So <coughs> it would be hard to be like different in that regard. So <coughs> the other way to split uh, those uh, extreme programming practices are by splitting them on coding practices, development practices, and <coughs> sorry, and business practices. And that's done uh, by the community actually itself. Mm, there's a really good uh, and a small book, I think everybody should get one, uh, called Extreme Programming Pocket Guide in English. Uh, it's all like, I don't know, like perhaps 80 pages, uh, hydrated knowledge uh, about, uh, about the problem. So if it comes to coding practices, it's code and design simply. You have things like, you ain't going to need it. You probably heard about it. I'm going to just rephrase it uh, back again. Keep it simple, stupid. So applying these kind of rules to how you design and how do you code. That's why I'm not going to show any kind of code right now and in this presentation at all. I just want to reduce it to the things that I really need. Refactor mercilessly. Yeah, thing about refactoring. What's refactoring? Is it, if, I, if I'm modifying code and actually I make more writes to the database, that's refactoring or not? It's not, because refactoring is changing the code but without modifying the behavior of that code, right? And there are a lot of techniques to do refactoring without modifying uh, the actual behavior of the code. And why this is required? Because at the end of, of the day, when you develop some kind of you know, like set of code, you need to maintain it so it's going to be usable like tomorrow, right? And that's... XP in general um, encourages you to go with refactoring uh, as much as you can so the code will be maintainable and, 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 and this kind of stuff. Develop coding standards. That's a really uh, controversial thing, kind of, uh, because people mostly go with tabs or spaces problems in this kind of places, but I think everybody should download PHP source and check the coding standards that they have uh, as a file into the, uh, committed into the repository. It's even said in the coding standards that if your function, if your C function is given a pointer, you never should release the memory from that pointer. Only if you have a different parameter, which is a Boolean, 
that will your function, right? And if the color of that function tells you true, then you're allowed to uh, free the memory from, from that pointer, for example, right? So, or from that address. So these kind of things. Why this is important? Because it actually removes a lot of discussions from code reviews. It's not my solution versus your solution. We have a standard here, dude. We decided to do it this way, and we have to keep it this way, right? So it helps in consistency between teams. This is a common contract between people that we are going to do it this way. Develop a common vocabulary. It's a thing that DDD, that everybody loves today, um, uses. They call it a uh, ubiquitous language, it's, is it the term? So um, a proper, proper set of uh, things or uh, terms that are being equally understood between different teams, both business uh, and developers or the teams themselves, so that everybody is using the, name, the same names for the same objects, concepts, etc., etc., to avoid confusion. Second part, developer practices. Adopt test-driven development. Now, test-driven development doesn't mean unit tests only. Actually, uh, Leszek, uh, Leszek, are you with us? No, I don't see you. But uh, who was on the butterfly effect uh, presentation yesterday? So what Leszek did? <coughs> Leszek had to deal with legacy code. He didn't write unit tests. I wouldn't write unit tests for that too. But before he modified the code, he uh, created a functional test that actually tests the system and the outcome before he modified that. Test-driven development is not only about unit tests. It's like trying to save some kind of state or incrementally uh, build up to a target solution with keeping your bug safe. It's, it's, it, it, it's like this, and that's really important to remember. You can go with functional tests for acceptance criteria in the stories <coughs> and make automate it. So practice per programming, the really, uh, personally, I don't like that. Not that I'm an introvert, but I don't like that people have a different keyboard layout. So switching in, uh, into in, by the one computer actually is quite uh, quite troublesome for me. But this is <coughs> this is the most constraining uh, constraining thing um, when it comes to people. It requires you know like hygiene. It requires proper communication skills and mindset and, and the attitudes. Really hard to do. <coughs> you need to find a really good person to do that. Adapt collective code ownership, which means. Everybody's responsible for uh, all the code, and everybody has the right to modify any line of the code. That's really huge and powerful, but, but it allows you to be enough committed to the case uh, and take care about uh, the, the project. Integrate continually. So you, everybody's heard about continuous integration, right? These are servers. You can use continuous integration servers to do the job. But what's really important about this is that you need to have a proper branching model. Let's use it with the standard Git flow, right? And the thing is that you should actually pull in code from like development branch to your feature branch as soon as new changes come in, like even daily. They say even like four hours if, if that's uh, so uh, dynamic. But if you're waiting for with a feature on a feature branch for like two weeks and then try to integrate it, kaboom, big bangs, you should avoid them always. So that's why integrating fast and frequently, not only using, it's not only about using the CI server, right? Uh, this is really required to uh, keep up. So the last part, business practices. I'm just pointing them out and I only marked the red one because this one is really uh, important for the developers, uh, except for this uh, work at sustainable pace. Release regularly, which means like, I don't know, every week every two weeks, uh, perhaps uh, every a couple of days. Why? Because, for example, if, if you have database migrations or data migrations, if you re release frequently, you make those migrations frequently, right? So there's no big migration session that you need to run a deployment after for two weeks, and the deployment itself will take like, uh, or migrations will take like eight hours, because you did that already multiple times on the road. Okay, now <coughs> the last thing, so individuals. So it's us, 
us, us, and only us. We need to develop a proper toolkit for, uh, for ourselves. So the tools at hand that we have are various principles. So we've already covered a little bit of that. We can go with best practices when it comes to coding, development processes, publishing, deployments, automation. Everybody should kind of study the subject uh, kind of uh, on his own, depending on the project and, and this kind of stuff. Knowledge about <coughs> patterns. So there are a series of web pages that are going to be available, but there are three types of patterns uh, that I would like everybody to know. These are, of course, design patterns. Then we have the enterprise archi architecture uh, design patterns. And also, Kent Beck um, wrote a different book uh, on patterns. These are called implementation patterns. So li really small patterns, even to a class or metered level, that could be applied in order to make like really, really good code. So I urge everybody to dig into like uh, all three of uh, those types. Powerful programming, programming languages. So not necessarily, sorry, but PHP is not necessarily the only language in the world when it comes to solving problems. We already saw that on different presentations. People go with Go, people go with Java in, in, in different cases, and that's, that's pretty okay because in the end of the day, you need to solve a problem in a most efficient manner. So if doing a small technological switch will unlock your agility in the future, I would definitely do that. Literature, so hello, hello, it's 2016. Most of the concept that we are talking about, like extreme programming, like Scrum, or this kind of stuff, is based on ideas that were developed in past century. A lot of, a lot of the books and, 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 and the knowledge itself is f like really back from the past. The problem with PHP community is that, uh, and the language itself, is that we mature really, really slowly. It's getting better from year to year, but a lot of things are already there. It's already in the books, already in the other languages. It's a matter of learning. We have a lot of manifests. One of them is the Agile Manifesto. The second is Software Craftsmanship Manifesto. Who's heard about Software Craftsmanship? Okay, you guys sign up for it, or you just heard about it? That's an open question, I do not expect an answer. Uh, so yeah, the thing about uh, the, the second one is there ha there's actually a movement of people who decided to okay, keep up uh, with, you know, like constantly learning and improving and going a little bit out of the scope of a single technology uh, because they treat software not as a, you know, like, child or something like that. They, they, they treat it as a, as a craft, software development as a craft. And they want to be masters of the craft, thus constantly improving. And if you go with that path, I deeply believe that uh, you are going to be a, a better developer as an individual, and thus you can contribute to the product, to the team, and uh, to, yeah, essentially that's it. So another thing that I really like to cover is the knowledge of anti-patterns. So who knows what's an uh, arrow anti-pattern, for example? It's a really easy thing to spot, actually. If you look on the code and you have uh, things like PHP opening tag, some class, a method, and then if, 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 was for, for, for else, and this kind of stuff. And you need to go out of the scope, 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 scope. Essentially, that's a code smell, right? And it's looking like an arrow. But yeah, easily to spot, most probably high uh, cyclometric complexity if you do a static analysis for the code with, with the tools that we already have, right? But there are numerous other anti-patterns. And I think knowing about the anti-patterns is equally important like knowing the patterns because you can notice that something is going wrong at some point. And we have like different initiatives. So probably uh, you saw the PHP in the right way web page. People stood up and decided to build up um, the set of best practices in order to address the problem that actually the internet is full of uh, outdated uh, PHP uh, tutorials, right? So they decided, okay, let's stop people learning some outdated knowledge. Let's go with the new ones. So industry standard acronyms, SOLID. Sorry, everybody has to know these principles. 
single responsibility, lisk dependency injections, uh, interface segregations. This, this, these basic principles, actually, if you follow them correctly, and you're uh, correctly aware of them, will give you proper quality and flexibility and agility of the code. Things like KISS, we've already talked briefly about this, keep it simple, stupid, do not over-design, always try to get things simple, do not repeat yourself. So not only code duplication, if you have like tedious uh, processes, automate them. Just release your time so we can do better things, uh, faster and this kind of stuff, and you ain't gonna need it. So just remove the things that actually won't be needed. Do not anticipate, do not uh, go, uh, do not make assumptions about the business. If business is going to want to have a feature that you're thinking of, they are going to ask it. Until they don't, don't do it. So as with any other kind of tools, you can go bad, go mad with it. Anything put to extreme, like solid put to extreme is bad. Yagni put to extreme, which will, will make actually people neglect everything. You don't want that as well. So, closing things up. Summary. There are no silver bullets in software development. The thing that I've shown you here is not a complete solution for every problem in the world. It's simply my idea how we could possibly uh, attack these kind of problems. Be pragmatic and balance everything. Never go to extreme. Either one or uh, the, the other way around. The tools are already there, learn them. So, as I said, PHP has a lot of things like PHP Unit, B Hat, uh, you can use Selenium as a, a driver for functional test with PhantomJS as a headless browser. Limitless, limitless, it's, 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 it's already there. Browse this website. When, if you're going to track like anti-patterns and what people do when it comes to stupid, the daily WTF, uh, is is the one of the nicest sources to do that. When introducing change, do it step by step, avoiding big bangs. I'm hoping that you guys will come back. One, one, one. Okay, I'm closing it up. So uh, I'm hoping that you guys, when you come back uh, to work, uh, you actually will try to dig more uh, into the topic and. Uh, introduce it, but please avoid big bangs. Never, you, you will never win by you know pushing like ten of those ideas at the time, step by step. The thing that I really like to do, and it's a mantra: learn, apply, repeat. Learn, apply, repeat. Because this is a lot of knowledge. This is a lot of practices to do, and uh, it requires a, a lot of uh, effort. So this this has to be a continuous process. Stay open-minded and always be ready for change. So do try to m remove that feeling when you saw the change, that business why you know plan right. So we don't want that. So what if I'm working with legacy software? Refactoring. Everybody knows the reference. It's hard to get to that point. If you do it wrong, a big ball comes uh, and chases you, right? So you really need to bear that in mind and be careful about uh, when you go with refactoring. And I think we have the time for questions or not? OK, so let's go with two quick questions. Uh, I will be happy to discuss uh, all that stuff uh, with any of you somewhere there. Let's call it. Okay, anybody wants to ask something? I kind of anticipated that. Thank you very much. <laughs> if somebody, uh, come again? It was me, like 10 years ago. So uh, yeah, in terms of references, I can give you the, some, you know, like links or uh, books uh, when it comes to that, uh, so you can track down things yourself. Once again, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>